My name is Leslie Hendrickson. I'm part of the steering committee and a longtime friend of the festival. Just a couple of things before we get started. We're using the webinar format. That means you're not going to appear on screen as a participant. We can't hear you and you're on mute. So um, the session is going to last about 25 to 30 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end. And the way you can ask those questions is by using the Q&A thread down at the bottom. So please put your questions in there. In the chat, you will find more information about our authors and our other events today and on May 3rd. There are also links to our independent bookstore partners, the Bookshop of Beverly Farms and Jabberwocky Bookstore in Newburyport. They have all the books from the authors of the festival and we encourage you to support them or your local bookshop, independent bookshop or any bookshop really. Um, again, we really appreciate you joining us, and without further ado, I am going to turn it over to author Sandel Morse. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this wonderful, wonderful event. Thanks so much to everyone at the Newburyport um, uh, the festival, and um, I'd like to give a big shout out to the entire writing community. Um, I feel that they have embraced me in a way that I, I never, never expected um, at this time. And I have to give a special thank you to a woman that I met um, in very early February. I signed up for a class she was taking called Demystifying Social Media. And I figured with a book coming out, I would need that. So um, I think that workshop changed the trajectory of this book. So I would like to give a special shout out to Jenna Blum. I'm here to talk about The Spiral Shell, a French village reveals its secrets of Jewish resistance in Vichy, France. This is my debut memoir at this age. Um, and I'm going to briefly tell you how I came to write this book. And then I'm going to read a bit from the book, show you some photos of places and tell you about events that happened there. And in the final 10 minutes, I'm delighted to take your questions. At age 71 in 2011, I was awarded a residency at Moulin -A, uh, a writer's retreat in Ovilar, France. The retreat is owned and operated by the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. And before I left, I started researching the village. And I discovered that Ovilar was on the pilgrimage route. In French, it's called the Chemin. And it leads to the shrine of St. James in Santiago del Compostelo. Well, when I think of a pilgrim's route, I think about crusaders. And when I think about crusaders, I wonder if Jews had lived anywhere near the village during that time. And then my thoughts jumped to the Second World War, and I wondered whether Jews had lived there during the Second World War. I knew that France was occupied, but I really didn't know what that meant. So I decided I would try to find out. A friend gave me the name of a nine-year-old boy who lived in the village with his parents during the war, and he was a resistance courier. And his name was John Hirsch, or Hirsch. Well, my maiden name is Hirsch. And so when I heard that matching name, it just hooked me. And so um, I, um, I like to say that I fell down into this work and I did, but I also pursued it. Um, I am going to read a passage from the very beginning of the book and um, I don't have to really explain anything to you. This is the book. This, it's called The Spiral Shell. And I think I better get my glasses for this one. All right. I knew so little of my own history. On my father's side, I had two names, Henriette Ducasse and Jacques Hirsch, my great great grandparents, parents, both born in Ericourt, France a commune in the Alsace that used to go back and forth between France and Germany, a spoil of war. 
Newly married, the couple sailed into New York Harbor, and as far as the family knew, they washed up onto American shores without a past. My father told me only those names, no names of their parents, grandparents, sisters, or brothers. No stories of family's joys or its heartbreaks and struggles. Whatever had gone before evaporated into the air of a brand new world. My father told me stories of his family's American successes. A brownstone on the Upper East Side, a shoe store on Fifth Avenue, a block long, he would say, the space between his gesturing hands growing wider and wider. For me, a child given to fantasy and fairy tales, that shoe store grew into a department store and the brownstone into a castle. Yet there was truth to my father's stories. I had a newspaper clipping from 1902, probably from the society pages of the Hartford Current, announcing a marriage and listing the elegant wedding presents received. Quote, among them being a check of a large amount from Leo M. Hirsch, an uncle of the groom. This was my great grandfather, proprietor of that block long shoe store. The Hirsches were German Jews, reformed Jews, aspiring to both social status and wealth, assimilation, their goal. My father taught me that being Jewish was no different from being Christian. It's a religion, that's all he'd say, as if to convince himself as well. He wanted to pass, and he wanted me to pass, not inside the house or among fellow Jews, but in the Christian world. He insisted Hirsch was a German, not a Jewish name. For years, I didn't know he was wrong about our name, but I did know he was wrong about Judaism and Christianity. Growing up, I shared things with my Jewish friends I didn't share with my gentle, Gentile friends. A nod, a glance, a meaningful touch on the shoulder. I knew, too, there were places I wasn't welcome. Once, visiting Grandma Rose, my father's mother, and Harry, my step-grandfather, in, Mar in Miami Beach, where they spent winters, I saw an, a sign in the window of a boarding house, no Jews. I saw signs over drinking fountains, colored, white. With or without signs, America named its outsiders. In that old newspaper clipping, the word reverend replaced rabbi, temple replaced synagogue. The ceremony was performed by the Reverend Mr. Levy, of the Orange Street Temple. When you changed rabbi to reverend, you tossed away centuries of learning, letting assimilation subsume knowledge and culture. When I was a child, school forms asked for my religion. Write Hebrew, my father would say. What's wrong with putting Jewish? Just do it. My friends didn't go around calling themselves Hebrews. We were Jewish. We didn't say Jew, an insult. And because we were growing up in the shadow of the Second World War, we knew about concentration camps, gas chambers, and lampshades made of human skin. We whispered about those lampshades on the playground the way we whispered about sex, knowing and not knowing, believing and not believing. So now I am uh, going to master this split screen thing, and I am going to show you seven photographs of places um, and then tell you a little bit about events that happened there. Um, this first uh, photograph is my studio at Mulana Neff. And on this, there are the four things that are essential to me when I write. One is my computer, uh, flowers of some sort, a pot of flowers or some flowers in a vase. Um, and my lined pad, I always start in, in longhand and coffee. And I have my coffee. Um, and 
I would um, like to show you the next photo is my hand holding a fig. When I arrived in Ovilar, I understood that there were figs growing everywhere on these trees. Well, I adore figs, but I couldn't see them. So a friend told me to think Adam and Eve. And so I brought to mind that image of Adam and Eve and their covering of figs and the leaves, the broad leaves with the deep, deep lobes. And I started seeing those leaves and then looked underneath and voila, figs. This next photo is the, um, the Chemin. I was invited by a new friend to spend the weekend walking the Chemin with her. And we passed pilgrims, we passed religious people, we passed folks on holiday. And the more I walked, the more I wondered about my walking this path because this was a Christian path, this was a pilgrimage. And then Priscilla told me that we were not walking toward the shrine of St. James, but in the opposite direction. And I thought, well, that was rather fitting for a Jew. This is the tallest house in Ovilar. And as long as I've been visiting the village, it's been boarded up. Uh, but during the Second World War, German soldiers patrolled from the rooftops of that, of that house. And I would assume that they were looking for resistance um, activity because that place, that village, had both resistance and uh, collaboration going on. And it had German soldiers. This is the clock tower. And it's the northern entrance to the, um, to the village. Um, on the morning of August 24th, 1942, trucks from the gendarmerie just up the hill came through that archway very, very early, and they arrested a family that was sheltering, and they were in that second house on, um, on the left. And they were Bruno Gazelli and Adele Kurzweil, and Adele was 17. They loaded that family into open back trucks along with other families, and they drove to Septons, which uh, was an internment camp outside of Montabon, which is an hour's drive from Ovilar. From all, Montabon, they were, they were shipped to Drancy and holding camp on the outside of Paris. And from there to Auschwitz, where all three were gassed on arrival. This next slide is, of, in, a, takes, is in a village called Bouyusser d'Ordon. And it is about two hours north of Ovilar. And there was a woman that I met, Germaine Polikov. She was 92 when we met, and she passed away this past February at 101, and I absolutely adored her, and I still do. She, uh, I met her through a mutual friend, and she was a caretaker in this house. And this house, it looks short, but there's a long facade along the other little street. And this house housed 70 Jewish refugee girls. And Germaine was one of the caretakers in this house, along with three others. And the, um, there was Madame Gordon, who was the director. What you can't see in this photograph, and this is right in a little tiny square just in the village, you cannot see a statue of the Virgin and Child. You cannot see the massive Abbey of St. Peter that borders one side. You cannot see a restaurant that was owned and operated by the Lacaze family, Catholics who were part of the resistance. In fact, the Lacaze daughter took care of the youngest of the Jewish refugee children in rooms above the restaurant. And so this is 
a village where the J Jewish children, their caretakers, were hiding in plain sight. This photograph of a water pump is in the garden of a very, very, very large chateau. And this is in Ovilar. It's really a petite little village on its own called Saint Michel, but it belongs to the, to the village of Ovilar. And here in 1943, um, the Gestapo arrested the parents of that young resistance courier. And I, this spot is not a place that people really go to very often, but I, I just couldn't photograph the, the, the place, the exact spot where they were taken. So I took a picture of this um, water fountain, which to me is kind of like a sculpture, sculpture, and I love it. So I am going to stop share screen and go back and read you one more uh, brief passage, and then I will um, open for questions. And this involves Germaine I, when I am interviewing her in her home outside of Paris. And I have to, the other person mentioned, and this is Leon, who was her husband. He worked with the resistance during the war. Uh, and he became a very famous historian. He actually accompanied the French delegation to Nuremberg. And the other hot person mentioned is my husband, Dick. I asked about a single day Germain remembered vividly. Germain folded her hands loosely in her lap and spoke of a day in 1944 when German soldiers were marching through Beaulieu sur Dordogne and heading to Normandy. They were nervous, edgy, and shooting wildly. I was, Germain rounded her hands and drew a dome in front of her belly, expecting my third child, carrying my baby in one arm, dragging Daniel by the hand, and running across a field to woods. I heard a shot. I knew what it was. I wasn't frightened. I felt calm. I don't know why. Naturally, she was frightened, but fear propelled her and gave her strength. A woman, pregnant, carrying her baby, dragging her toddler, her heart pounding, her belly cramping, adrenaline pumping her legs. I looked into my cup of golden tea. How did she find her way through all that, then integrate into the woman she had become? A few days before, Germaine's granddaughter, a woman who became very religious and lived in Israel, had come to visit with her children, boys who wore payas, side curls. I wanted to make them lunch, Germaine said. They came from so far. I offered a cup of tea. My granddaughter refused. She would not let the boys eat, not even a cookie. This woman was the daughter of the baby in Germaine's belly. That day, she raced for the woods. I knew they were orthodox, Germaine said. Still, I was insulted. I don't like orthodox. She meant orthodoxy. I agreed. Had I been visiting that day, I would have told that granddaughter to forget her rules of kashrut that allowed her to eat only kosher foods from kosher plates and to drink only from kosher cups. I would have told her to take a cup of tea with her grandmother to let Germaine give cookies to the boys. Their great-grandmother had been to the edge and survived. To break bread, to share a meal with family and friends, this was nachis, a Yiddish word that, like most Yiddish words, squiggled out from under definition. Nachis was pleasure, but more than pleasure, nachis was the pure joy a child brought to parents or grandparents. Speaking English, Germaine said, the more and more I get old, the more I can express what I feel. Only now I realize life was not ordinary. So we agree. At the door, Germaine said, people tell me I was courageous to do what I did. I did not know. 
Perhaps courage is acting not out of bravery, but out of the essence of who you are. Germaine offered her cheek and we kiss kissed. She was tired, she must nap. We talked a long time. You are going back to the States, she said. Yes, I said. I'd been away a month. I had decided with fairness to Dick, a month was the limit for my absences. For years, he provided the fan financial and emotional support for me to become more than I ever thought I could be, and I was grateful. Germaine and I exchanged email addresses. She took my hand and held on. You must tell me when you will return. Not if I would return, when. I thought about journalists coming to interview Leon, but never Germaine, as she sat in one of the apricot velvet chairs, looking on her own story, rumbling. Yes, I would return to listen to Germaine and continue my search for answers to questions I hardly knew. The best way to find what I was looking for was let it reveal itself. Thank you. I'm ready for your questions. Thank you so much, Sandel. That was beautiful. And we do have a few questions. Two, in fact, um, where does the title come from? Please, please uh, tell us how you decided on, to use the spiral shell as your title. Um, that will be revealed. I don't want to tell you. It's pretty, pretty far into the book, but um, oh, I can tell you this much. It works. I, I will tell you this much. Um, this, um, I was on a tour of the Marais, the, uh, the Jewish section, an area that I did not frequent that much. And a, um, a guide showed a, the, an indentation in some of the limestone. All of the limestone in France comes from an underground, that was once an underground sea. And so you can see these little fossil imprints in it. And I was so taken with that. And I went back and I traced it. And later on, he found um, a little shell. He was looking in the gravel and I didn't know what he had. And he put it, he just put it in my hand. And where is it? Um, it's here, but I'm not gonna find it right this minute. But anyway, um, it became a, a metaphor for me. It became, the, something about these stories spiraled up for me and they just kept going and going and going. And so that's where the spiral shell comes from. Great. Were the villagers forthcoming and talking about their activities during the war and, and collaborating with you? Not at all. I met a, um, the first person that I met to speak with uh, was a man named Gerhard Schneider. He's German. Uh, and Catholic, he's a theologian and a philosopher. His wife is an academic and she is French. So early in their marriage, they set out to try to bridge the two cultures. And Gerhard was also very, very open to, the, uh, to Jewish history, uh, first in his native Germany and then in Ovilar. And so someone said to me, if you wanna know anything about Jewish history in Ovilar, you have to go talk to Gerhard. And so I did that. And then from there, I found other people who would open up. But then another person that I found was uh, Robert, and he retired in the village. He's French. Um, but the villagers themselves, there was only one who, well, Gerhard and Robert are villagers, but people who have lived there for a long, long time. Um, there was only um, Odette who had who had not lived through that time, but her husband was actually a um, worked in the resistance during the war. So that's a good segue into another question, which is other than the examples that you just read, how did the village village's resistance manifest itself? Um, they had no idea what I was doing. So it, it, it's, I think I'll let you read this in the book, but there is one time when I am interviewing Odette with Gerhard and a villager came in and I could just sense her hostility. Gotcha. 
And what was the range of emotions that you experienced as you were researching and writing this book? Would you repeat that, Leslie? What was the range of emotions that you experienced as you were writing and researching the book? It's a really, really good question. Um, was it, it, it was happening over so many years. And, and I think some of what I experienced was absolute surprise. And some of it was about what am I doing? Who do you think you are? Millions of people have written about the Holocaust. They don't need another book from you. You're not a historian. Um, and then- The doom loop. <laughs> the doom loop. Um, and then absolute wonder at meeting some of these people and having them share their stories. Um, I'm, I'm butting the line. I wanted to ask you a quick question about process. You said in their first slide that you write longhand and then write, you know, then go to your computer. How do you know when it's time to switch? Well, that's not a hard answer because when my hand gets tired <laughs> and I can't keep up with what's going on, I go to my computer and I'll put some in and then I'll go back. Um, I, uh, attended a, a Zoom event with Lily King, who has written this amazingly wonderful book, novel. And she writes everything in longhand in a notebook. And she goes right through to the end. And I don't do that. I do it in patches. Gotcha. So a, a lot of people are asking about the wartime, uh, the villagers at wartime, were they collaborating with the Germans? Were they resisting? the Germans, um, what was happening in the village at that time? Yeah, that was one of the things that was most interesting to me because that existed side by side, collaboration and resistance. So um, I told you about the couple that was arrested by Gestapo. And that night after we visited that place, uh, Gerhard's wife, um, took me aside after dinner and she had received a phone call from someone who didn't like us walking around in that area and what did we want and blah, blah, blah. And um, she was saying, I still can't get this out of my head. Did you see the photographs of Bertha? The, she was the wife and in one photograph, she looks young, she has full cheeks. And in the other one, she's hollowed out and she looks so old and she was a woman about maybe 35. And um, I said, oh, someone from the whatever, resist, uh, the German whatever turned them in because that's what I had read. And this Gerhardt's wife looked at me, uh, Mary Jo, and she said, yes, but who told him? And it was like, oh, an informer. So side by side. Um, and so another question is, how did you decide to write this memoir about not only your own Jewish experience, but, you know, including this experience and, and wrapping those things together? Okay. So I set out not to write a memoir and not to write a long nar narrative. Um, I set out to write essays about these people. And I published quite a few of them in, in literary magazines. And then I thought, oh, they're all related. I can collect them into a collection of essays. And that shouldn't be too hard. And so I took a course at Grub Street in Boston called Finding Your Book. And what happened there was the uh, the instructor who's a literary agent and also teaches in an MFA program um, told me that it wasn't working, these essays needed to be linked together. And so she suggested that I put little italicized paragraphs at the beginning of each essay that links them all together. All right, well, that didn't work either. And then, um, I realized that I was writing a narrative. And then what was missing from the narrative was really my own journey. And 
I think that the connection, my own connection to these stories uh, was there all along, but it was kind of slipping around under the surface and I had to bring it up. I gotcha. Um, so we only have time for one more question. I really appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you so much. And um, so someone has asked about what tips you have for someone trying to publish, um, especially someone who's maybe been writing a long time and hasn't quite been successful yet. Keep going. I, I, I don't know what made me keep going. I could sort of open a cabinet here behind me and I can show you uh, about three novels, a novella, a three act play, all sitting on the shelf and also a memoir. Um, and I, I think I was, hap I was satisfied. I thought I was publishing in the literary magazines. I was publishing nicely. Um, I loved to write. And then when this memoir started coming together, I pushed it much farther than I had pushed the other manuscripts. And another piece of advice, get help if you need it. Um, and don't be afraid to take workshops. I mean, I signed up for an essay writing workshop that I'm gonna be taking online in May. And I think I used to have a feeling about, oh, if I go back, then I'm not this thing, this writer person, but just keep learning and keep at it. Thank you so much. And you have um, some other events coming up? Did I see? I do, I do. I have an event on Tuesday um, sponsored by Gibson's Bookshop. And then I have one on May 1st sponsored by Print in Portland, Maine and the Maine Writers and Publishers Alliance and Mechanics Hall. And they're all up to date on my events page on my website. Thank you. Liz. Great. Well, hopefully people can uh, visit that and see some more of uh, Sandell. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you to all our participants for joining us for the festival online. I well, hope you'll be able to check out some other events and I hope you have a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Thank you and stay safe. Take care. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> <laughs>